Welcome everyone. I'm Barbara Slavin. I direct the Future of Iran Initiative at the Atlantic Council. And we are in for a really interesting discussion today. Uh, Nadre Shamlu, one of our very talented senior fellows, has followed Iran's economy for many years, including during long and distinguished service at the World Bank. Uh, she recently wrote an excellent piece for our Iran Source blog that I recommend to you, uh, that among other things compared Iran's economic performance since the 1979 revolution to countries that were at an equivalent uh, stage at that time. Uh, Nadere has identified many of the issues that have kept Iran behind countries such as Turkey and South Korea in terms of their share of global, global GDP and per capita incomes. Um, today, Nadere is going to uh, moderate a discussion on the Iranian economy among four accomplished Iranian economists and uh, entrepreneurs. And they're going to talk about where Iran's economy stands today, what the problems are, what the opportunities are, uh, and what its trajectory looks like as Iran marks its the 43rd anniversary of uh, its revolution. Um, also, as you know, we're at a sensitive time in talks in Vienna, uh, with many in Iran certainly looking forward to a deal that would lift onerous sanctions, and we'll talk about that as well. Um, as you all know, those uh, who've done many of these panels over the last few years, uh, put your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And after comments by our speakers and a little bit of back and forth among us, we will get to your questions. So uh, without further ado, let me hand the virtual podium over to Nadri. And good, good afternoon, uh, and thank you very much, Barbara, for the very generous uh, uh, introduction. I, I very much appreciate it, and it's a great honor and great pleasure for me to be given this opportunity to, uh, to bring to you four outstanding uh, and knowledgeable uh, people from inside Iran as well as outside Iran, a mix of uh, uh, economists as well as uh, business people, to present perhaps a very balanced and uh, diversified view of what is happening in Iran on the uh, on the economic side. I'm really delighted and I really thank my panelists uh, tremendously for giving their time so generously for for this uh, for this session. Uh, without much ado, because there is a lot that uh, we can learn from them. I would like to maybe uh, just give a very short uh, introduction as to what uh, they, who they are and what they do. And uh, if I miss anything and if I don't do justice to your extensive experience, please do correct me and do add to it because, um, you know, I think your experience is too valuable for, for us not to know everything about it. Uh, well, let me, uh, it, it just also so happens that not only will I introduce my speakers in an alphabetical order, but also it so happens that they will be uh, talking in more or less uh, in the same order as I introduce them. I would like to introduce, uh, to, uh, to start with Mr. Uh, Ali Amiri. He is a serial entrepreneur uh, in the Middle East and has been active in many sectors, among them, for instance, uh, um, uh, among them, for instance, uh, he has been uh, in commercial, um, uh, sorry, consumer goods, in ICT, in commercial vehicles, in banking, in manufacturing. Um, he, uh, he has established two very famous famous uh, for a very important banks, uh, uh, the Kara Farin Bank, as well as uh, the Bank of the Middle East. Uh, he has a, a degree from Columbia University and a business degree uh, and a, an MBA from Harvard um, Howard University. My uh, second uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Sara Bazubandi, and uh, she has been uh, a very frequent commentator on anything, any topic related to the economy uh, of Iran as well as the Middle East. She is a non resident fellow of the Arab Gulf State Institute in Washington, as well as a fellow. Uh, a senior fellow at the uh, as a fellow senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Uh, she is also uh, a Marie Curie uh, fellow at the German Institute of Global and Area Studies, working on Iran's uh, economy. She holds a PhD in economics as well as many other degrees in engineering and so on. I will uh, not go into in great detail about that. Uh, my next speaker is uh, Dr. Ali Hamedani. 
علی همدان صادقی همدانی he is an economist by training he has he holds a PhD in economics uh, but has had uh, extensive experience in Iran's private sector he has been um, Uh, trade, he has been active in the, with uh, the uh, various aspects of trade and industry, among them, for instance, uh, Emesco Company, which is the largest uh, steel uh, producer in the, in the Middle East. And he is also the exclusive uh, agent of uh, Metallic Ferro Alloys, uh, which is a, an Indian company uh, and also one of the largest uh, Indian companies, which is also active in Iran. And finally, and last but not least, and I'm so delighted to have had the, uh, the, the pleasure to um, add, uh, to, to, to welcome uh, Mrs. Um, uh, Mrs. Mahfashe Tayyarani, she is also a serial entrepreneur a serial, in, in Iran in the, in the area of petrochemicals. She, in 1992, she founded an, uh, the New Yon Bosphor Engineering Company, which is, uh, an active, uh, which is active in trading and in the business of catalyst and specialty pe uh, petrochemicals. Uh, she is a founder in 2002. She founded uh, a share uh, and is a shareholder and board member of Exir Chemical Terminal and um, uh, in the pet, um, petrochemical zone of the Bandare uh, Imam Khomeini in Iran, uh, which is a joint venture with the oil tanking uh, company of Germany and oil uh, Ot Otfiel uh, of, of Norway. And in 2007, she founded, uh, and she's a shareholder and chairwoman of Epnestino Petrochemical Company, also in Iran. And also, uh, she is not only a very accomplished uh, uh, businesswoman and entrepreneur, but she is also the uh, chair of the Foundation for Women's Entrepreneurship in Iran, which is uh, a very large Uh, organization promoting women's entrepreneurship and helping and mentoring other women entrepreneurs. So with much, uh, uh, much ado, I would like to pass it on to my really uh, delightful and uh, accomplished uh, uh, um, panelist. Uh, what I would like to ask you, and we will uh, sort of like go around, uh, uh, if, if you could take a few minutes, maybe four to five minutes, to give us a, uh, your perspective of where Iran is standing right now, both from the perspective of looking at Iran from outside, as well as looking you know, from inside, outside, uh, to whatever is outside. But I would like to ask you to take a few minutes and uh, provide us with your perspective and your views, and then we come back to, to the second round of the questions. So may I ask uh, Mr. Amiri to uh, to kick start this uh, this round. Thank you very much also for participating. I'm grateful to you. Sure, Ms. Yeah, Amiri? Yes. yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Yenada. Uh, That's uh, kind of you for inviting me. Um, I will take, uh, I've been trying to desperately take it down to five minutes. It might extend to six if you can bear with me. Um, and just quickly, first off, you give me too much honor by saying having established XYZ, I've been really the found, you know, amongst, uh, you know, much more able founding shareholders of in particular those two banks, but um, I, I wouldn't give me myself more credit than that, uh, but thank you. Um, with regards to your question, uh, you know, investment environment, um, I mean, against the backdrop, you know, in the uh, during the sanctions reprieve period, say 2015 to 2018, capital investments were made by local uh, businesses, and given the import um, substitution policy of of the uh, of the government, um, you know, quite a lot of investment in capacity was made, um, and then these were swiftly uh, and suddenly uh, left idle. Uh, by 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 the exit of foreign partners and suppliers in the ensuing years to now, and you know this immediately led to crisis management, uh, which is what we do nowadays. Um, you know, fast cutting of overheads, uh, indeed, uh, quite a few bankruptcies that um, you know we've witnessed over the years. Uh, those businesses that depended on local inputs for their um, uh, products, uh, you know, like in food stuff or indeed human capital, like the internet ecosystem, 
um, have fared in relative terms better than those industrial ones. And, you know, government support uh, for local industries um, where possible was not absent. You know, it, we, we, one, could, uh, one, one could witness it, but it too in a very dry operating uh, environment. And the current environment is, uh, you know, quite difficult, you know, due to the lack of access to Forex, capital equipment, banking credits, you know, budget deficits, high inflation. So not a lot of investment relative to potential, but rather ongoing crisis management and safeguarding of previous investments. And I leave it to other panelists uh, for the broad numbers that uh, will no doubt be in sync with what I just described. Uh, but that's hopefully looking at the past, uh, looking to the future, um, you know, uh, the, the future can be bright, it can be very bright. Um, assuming, assuming uh, that this round of JCPOA outcome will lead to, a, you know, a sentiment of economic predictability that is positive and that is lasting. So assuming this and the resolution of key economic policies that, uh, again, panelists will no doubt refer to um, today, assuming these, then, and only then, uh, over the next, say, decade or 15 years, Iran has formidable comparative advantages relative to its economic uh, rivals. Broadly speaking, Iran, you know, just to go through, you know, I, I don't know, some classical gists, you know, Iran has 20 trillion worth of hydrocarbons under its earth. It has something like 6% of Earth's natural resources. Uh, it has a human capital base that is amongst, um, you know, uh, the highest in university education as a percentage of population under the age of 40. I think it goes up to like, what, 70% or more. Um, it has an industrial base that is deep and goes back well into the 1950s, an agri base in acreage that, you know, approximates that of, say, France or Spain, a geography that, you know, in transit terms, perfectly positioned, you know, between the east and west, be that by land, sea or air. It has a viable capital market that I've witnessed, uh, you know, in terms of size, say, close to that of Sweden, uh, you know, perfect for the allocation of capital uh, resources across the economy. IPOs, think of that, you know, seen that. Um, um, so, you know, when you look at, when you take these attributes together and broadly speaking, you know, one can say, you know, we've got the capital base uh, of, of Saudi Arabia, we've got the human capital uh, of, and, and the industrial base of Turkey and primary, primary re, uh, mineral resources um, uh, within our land that neither of those two have. And so economically, these are, our, uh, are the roots of our comparative advantages. And, you know, in industries that combine these attributes to, for the production of value added intermediate goods to global supply chains of um, finished goods, then neither regional power, econo economic power can compete with us sustainably or efficiently in the long run. And if we indeed, if we get to the nurturing development of clusters and hubs correctly, very, you know, Michael Porter like, which I believe, uh, you know, the role of the government um, economic policy should be, uh, then a uh, few in Asia, I really believe as few in Asia will be able to compete efficiently, you know, at that end of the 15 a year run uh, on the sectors that, you know, we would have chosen in this economy. And, you know, they're quite, a, to finish off, there are quite a few um, uh, industries, um, but, you know, one easy example is the evolution of a deep cluster in the auto parts industry, you know, positioned uh, towards an $8 trillion annual market uh, size, any share of that will move the dial for an economy like Iran. And if, you know, we, you know, you develop and I can run through the list of industries we have, if we run those numbers within the range of potentials, my guess will, will be that, you know, we won't um, be far from a GDP per capita that is within the range mark of, say, Spain. Uh, but of course, again, this is optimistic. Um, you know, we need to get it right geoeconomically and geopolitically, you know, for at least 15 years to just, you know, re-emphasize 
uh, you know, my assumptions. And I want to say that again, because, uh, you know, I don't want other panelists to tell me that. Um, that's a given. Um, at this point, I'll, um, I'll, um, I'll just thank everyone and be a listener and um, wait for the next round. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, when I was uh, when I was uh, trying to select the panelists, I wanted to have a good balance, not only of women speakers and male speakers, men speakers, but then also of business people and economists, because the business people or entrepreneurs look always at the glass half full. And then the economists look, you know, more at the glass half half empty. So uh, I'm very delighted that you started off with a very, very op positive and optimistic and, of course, highlighting the, the immense opportunities that Iran has from every aspect. Uh, let me now turn to um, Dr. Bazubandi and ask her how she sees this, uh, the, the position of Iran, the opportunities of Iran from her perspective and from uh, her vantage point, uh, given, you know, given uh, her experience and her uh, studies that she has done. Thank you so much. I pass it on to you. Hi, greetings uh, from Hamburg. Um, thank you very much for the invitation, uh, Nader and the, the council. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, when I was uh, listening to Ali's, uh, Amir Ali's remark, I was I just constantly kept smiling because what I'm about to say, it's going to make it sound like me and Ali completely coordinated. And this is a double act of Sara and Amir Ali. But uh, honestly, we haven't really exchanged note that deeply. Um, so um, he, he uh, you know, he mentioned some some very very uh, important characteristics of Iranian economy. Uh, rightly pointed out the the natural wealth, and um, I'm going to start off from from that point from where he left off the conversation. So, like every economy, um, every economic story, uh, there are some good news and bad news always. Uh, so the the glass is never uh, full. It's never. Uh, completely empty. Uh, so there are always nuances and there are always good news and bad news. Um, the good news is that, as Amir Ali mentioned, the country has vast amount of natural resources. But the bad news is that because of lack of investment, international sanctions, uh, the politics of energy and the competition that exists around it, the production is inefficient, infrastructures are old, the downstream sector and is underinvested. Um, and at least for the past two decades, uh, in which Iran has been entangled in this uh, nuclear crisis, Iranians uh, have been jumping far too many hoops to be able to just maintain the energy export, um, just as a mean for economic survival. And that actually have exhausted a lot of those potentials for Iran. Um, the next bad news, unfortunately, is that whilst the policymakers in um, other energy exporting countries uh, in the region are gradually coming to terms with the future reality of global energy and slowly preparing themselves for the economic adjustments that are required to, to adapt to the global um, climate change, Iran policy space has been at least for the past two decades, again, I would emphasize, captured mainly by finding creative solutions that allow Iran to reconnect to, to the global economy. Um, all in all, uh, what we can see um, at the macroeconomic and in the political economic environment uh, in Iran is that, um, and in terms of the relationship between the states, society, and the economy, what I see is that these relationships are mainly characterized by the following three uh, factors, and they're dominated by these following three factors, basically. Um, corruption and bad policy choice, centralized planning that leads to dominance of the public sector, and of course, uh, above all of them, uh, this international sanctions. Uh, in an economic environment in which the state, the society and economy are all being captive to these factors, um, inevitable results are that the productivity across all factors of production is low. Rent-seeking behaviors are norms of business and the social gap is widening. Um, so on that specific point of social gap, which uh, 
I find it extremely important for the for the future of uh, socioeconomic structure of the country. I would like to share some 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 info, some data with you. Um, the uh, Ministry of Labour has published uh, its uh, first official uh, report um, for two thousand in, in the year of two thousand and. Uh, 19, March 2019, uh, March 2020. Um, sorry, not the first, the last official report. I do, I do apologize. That's the last official report that they have published on uh, the poverty level in Iran. Um, and they report and they confirm that roughly one third of Iranians now live below the poverty line, uh, defined by an income of around 25 million rials a month, which is almost around at the time with that exchange rate of 2019, 2020, was about roughly about $200 a month. Um, according to this report, poverty increased by 38% from March 2019 to March 2020. And that is mainly due to high inflation and rising prices of food stuff and housing and so on. Um, so the, whilst the state is busy trying to untangle um, the, the um, nuclear crisis and and you know the the, the political aspects uh, the political environment which is directly affecting uh, the Iranian economy the people are falling into poverty uh, at a very rapid rate and i think this is unfortunately the the half empty of of the glass that i that i see that is that is one of the uh, most unfortunate consequences of the current environment that we see in iran um, issues such as corruption, poor, good, uh, poor governance, um, wrong policy choices, and so on, have been widely acknowledged by by the political elite. So these are not things that you know nobody really um, wants to talk about. The more they are not uh, completely uh, unacknowledged or or not on the radar of of the state, uh, it is these are evident in from the political language of the senior politicians, from the members of the parliament all the way to the supreme leader himself. The challenges imposed by these issues uh, were free frequently raised, for example, in the last presidential election campaign. It was on the list of the election campaign promises of almost every candidate. So the state is aware of the current environment. The policy space is entangled, trying to bring Iran out of the isolation. So it leaves very little room to make improvements, um, hence the, the pressure on the people. In this environment where the formal economy is overshadowing, which is overshadowed by the state and the state's choices, as indeed, the people have been inevitably heading to the informal sector to seek economic activities. And um, now here I have a good news, a good piece of news. And the good news is that some of these economic activities are facilitated by uh, telecommunication advancements and allow the society to enjoy some of the benefits of the global transformation of uh, technology. Uh, in the midst of all of these um, economic, severe economic isolation. Uh, Iran has been going through, um, you know, if, if you go through, uh, for example, Instagram uh, pages of, of Iranian users, um, a high percentage of them are, are home businesses, homemade businesses. Uh, and um, I, I, I believe that with the, uh, and this is where, I'm, again, an, another happy point that I'm going to finish my remarks with, that is the entrepreneurship spirit, the economic creativity, and you know, the, uh, taking advantage of the last available channels for, by, the, by the Iranian population to um, generate economic activities. Um, are what go are go the factors that are going to keep non-state segments of the economy alive. So, with some much needed reforms that Ali also rightly mentioned, uh, Iran will be on on a good path to start slowly moving away from years of economic depression. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very uh, extensive and very deep uh, analysis. Uh, you mentioned three points, policy choice, public sector uh, domination, and sanctions. We can come to the topic of sanctions later, but maybe with the first two, public uh, pub policy choice and public sector um, you know, uh, domination, maybe I can uh, turn to Dr. Hamedani and ask him, how do you see, since you are both an economist and you know, in the private sector, you, can, you have probably a good uh, sense of where uh, how you assess these uh, these two issues uh, management public uh, you know policy choices how do you see this and uh, 
um, and I look forward to hearing your voice. Is it full or half full or half empty, whatever, whichever way we want to go? First of all, let me thank you to, uh, you know, Atlantic Council and also my colleagues, uh, particularly Ali and Sarah for their good point. Uh, the economic environment in Iran has been held back by domestic and international political environment. As a result, despite the economic potentials, such as natural resources, access to free waters and human capital, Iran has remained behind other regional economic powers. Iranian average GDP growth rate was almost null within a decade ago. The economic future of Iran uh, is, in my opinion, uh, closely linked with two factors, domestic factors and foreign dynamics. What I define as defining dynamic, foreign dynamics has two main aspects. The first aspect is uh, foreign investment. Iranian economy urgently needs foreign investment. The average growth of uh, gross, uh, the average growth of gross fixed uh, capital formation was minus 5% per year in the last decade. According to Iran's 2026 vision that was complied in 2003, on average, $50 billion investment is required each year in order to achieve 8% economic growth targets. The dollar equivalent of total liquidity circulating the whole economy uh, does not exceed than $150 billion. This is only three times bigger than the average annual investment the country needs and uh, is targeted in the vision. Therefore, the country is in, a, an, urge, is, is in an urgent uh, need of attract, attracting foreign investment. The next step is uh, reconnecting Iran to the international economy. Iran has been cut out of the global supply chain and regional trade ne network for several decades. Turkey, Azerbaijan, and Georgia removed Iran from the Silk Road by constructing the Zangzo rail and land corridor. Similarly, there are rumors that Turkey and UAE intend to replace Iraq with Iran in transit of goods. Iran has been more than a decade, it is more, it has been more, it has been more than a decade that Iran has been disconnected from international banking system because of the sanctions. Therefore, the stability and survival of the Iranian economy is very much dependent on the global economic system, returning to the global economic system. In addition to foreign dynamics that I, uh, that I mentioned here, uh, there is an urgent need for economic reform in Iran. Infl one, inflation control. The first one is inflation control. The annual inflation rate has hit above 40% by the end of most recent Iranian calendar month, while average global inflation rate stands around 2.4%. This level of inflation has created deepening macroeconomic instability that is very difficult for economic actors to cope with. Under such economy, under such condition, with or without the sanctions, economic environments will remain unstable and economic unsatisfaction will continue to rise. To rise. Secondly, energy subsidies removal. Iranian government pays almost more than $100 billion for energy subsidies, including almost $20 billion for petrol, $17 billion for gasoline, $26 billion for electricity, and $42 billion for gas. These subsidies do not help the poor people, but also benefit rich people more. In production sector, uh, it decreases cost of production artificially, as if producers are exporting energy. Reforms of, reforms of the energy market will definitely eliminate competitive advantages of many com companies. 
Thirdly, improving business environment. In terms of ease of doing business, Iran is ranked 127 amongst more than 190 countries. The Iranian very big government competes with the small private sector and creates a lot of bureaucracies and barriers to the entrepreneurship and the investment. Turkey is doing business uh, in Iran's neighborhood. Turkey is doing business rank in Iran's neighborhood is 33. The, stif- the difference in ranking is one of the reasons for the capital flow from Iran to Turkey, which has been accelerating in recent years. Fourthly, treatment of Dutch disease in the Iranian economy. As oil revenues increases, Iranian real usually appreciates compared to other currencies. This result in other sectors uh, getting more expensive for other countries to buy and imports becoming cheaper, making those sectors less competitive. Therefore, the National Development Fund of Iran needs to be reformed and more transparent to both save to both save for the future generations and to invest in infrastructures projects. The role of central bank and its independence from the government also needs to be on the list of government reforms. Fifthly, shifting from multiple exchange rate system to a floating exchange rate, managed floating exchange rate system is also very crucial. At the moment, there are several multiple multiple exchange rates in Iran Iranian economy. With the slogan of unifying multiple exchange rates, Rouhani's government in practice set dollar real rate at 42,000, meaning one dollar was equal to 42,000 reals. This rate was uh, reals is our current uh, is our local currency. This rate was almost one fifth of the market exchange rate. Ray C's government is also continuing, unfortunately, is also continuing this policy. Certain interest groups are benefiting from this policy to determine of the rest of population. Sixthly, all major privatization, all major economic activities in Iran are owned and controlled by the government. There is a conflict between social benefits and self-interest in governmental companies. This is a general rule, not only for Iranian companies, but also for other governmental companies uh, somewhere else. Substantial combating with the corruption is impossible unless a real and transparent privatization policy is implemented in Iran. Thank you again for the time. Thank you very much. This was such a such a uh, you know long list. I, I mean, you were even more uh, how should I say uh, tougher on on, uh, on on the Iranian economy than uh, than you know our friends from outside of Iran. And uh, I, I fully understand that you probably are seeing the uh, the all the nuts and bolts of where the economy is uh, needs to be fixed. Um, let me pass on. I mean, with all of these. Uh, all of these constraints and challenges and you know barriers uh, there are of course uh, Iranian uh, entrepreneurs and Iranian entrepreneurs at a you know fairly large scale and one of them I'm delighted to welcome Mrs. Tayrani is uh, is one of those entrepreneurs who is also not only in a very tough sector but also in a very male dominated sector globally and uh, i would like to hear from you how you see as an entrepreneur the whole environment and how you manage with all of these constraints i i, I noted about uh, eight or nine of them that dr um, uh, hamedani was was listing how do you deal with all of these uh, uh, constraints to you know and for such a long time because you're obviously uh, have been able to sustain your your business in in this area and also particularly if you could also so maybe reflect a little bit on and on the environment for women uh, entrepreneurs since you are you have probably ta- uh, you know uh, experienced it to your bone uh, in in that sense uh, so i would like to pass it on to you and uh, thank you very much again for participating thank you uh, dr thank Hamidani you for uh, thank you for your, uh, your invitation 
and uh, it's uh, an honor to be with uh, such a um, high scale uh, panel. Uh, as for uh, Iranian economy and uh, what we see in future, uh, I would agree with uh, many of those uh, potential which our friends um, uh, refer to. There are uh, a lot of potentials in Iranian economy, but uh, these potentials have not been used uh, properly during uh, the last four decades at least, or five decades even. Uh, so um, it's... Uh, our friends uh, again um, um, described uh, and explained uh, that uh, our economy has been isolated for a long time uh, after we had some hopes in 2015, uh, but uh, um, uh, very shortly afterward, because of uh, again uh, politics dominations on uh, economy. Uh, we, uh, we went to the same uh, route and to the same circle of uh, problems uh, in our economy, isolation, sanctions, making the uh, country um, sort of um, out of global economy. Uh, the global economy, as uh, we all know, has become sort of um, uh, a chain, uh, which uh, doesn't mean that every country uh, should produce everything inside the country. They are all connected together and uh, uh, products are being made in different economies. And uh, these relationship uh, and correlationship um, uh, uh, let's say somehow bounds everything together in these economies and it would be very difficult uh, for uh, uh, for let's say one political power in the world to isolate and uh, disrupt one economy out but what happens when you uh, disrupt yourself uh, when you are uh, out of uh, all the links and uh, connections with uh, neighbor economies, with big economies, with uh, investment, what happens that you are uh, uh, very, um, you are, uh, let's say, in a position that uh, this can easily uh, happen to you. Uh, one can, um, uh, let's say, put you out of all the relationship as, as uh, uh, other panelists refer to from uh, the uh, Silk Road, from uh, this road, from this uh, uh, oil um, uh, pipeline, from that oil or gas pipeline. So, and the opportunities do not uh, uh, do not exist forever. Uh, when we use the opportunities, we have uh, we have lost uh, uh, several several and uh, various uh, opportunities um, to be, let's say, uh, in connection uh, link between, for instance, Russia, Turkmenistan, and uh, uh, um, uh, Oman Sea. We have lost it even to Afghanistan with all the uh, problems they have. So um, it's, uh, it's always difficult to uh, gain the lost opportunities. And the uh, Iranian uh, economic environment is um, really uh, public sector dominated. Private sector is sort of uh, under pressure all the time, under pressure for uh, competition, under pressure for um, uh, when competing, when, uh, let's say, uh, trying to do things uh, and uh, trying to invest. But uh, it is uh, perhaps uh, um, partly um, being uh, tired of all the challenges, but, but really uh, the, the, um, the vision uh, can be positive only if uh, the, um, the um, let's say, the basic uh, fundamentals of economy are, uh, are used. There is a change of policies, there is 
change of uh, um, uh, uh, subsidies, uh, policies, change of uh, uh, all the, um, I mean, going towards the market economy. If uh, we do those changes, uh, we take the uh, right policies, if uh, the government and the whole, let's say, um, uh, the, the economy goes on the right direction, meaning uh, going to, to market economy, to, uh, let's say, right monetary policies, right, uh, let's say, um, uh, economic policies. Yes, there is a still um, a window but that window is not open for forever. That window would be closing with uh, getting uh, older, the country getting older. Um, we, uh, our, our uh, let's say, um, big uh, part of population, young part of population uh, now is passing 30s. It's uh, arriving in 40s. And uh, that means that uh, despite all the entrepreneurial um, uh, spirit in among the young people, uh, despite of all the let's say, um, uh, drives uh, with young people, with the economy, with the energy, with the, uh, um, uh, the, the country's wealth. This would not go uh, forever. We really, uh, the, uh, the whole um, economic activists inside the country, they hope that uh, this uh, happens, uh, let's say, sooner rather than later, that we have a peace uh, with with everybody around us, uh, with our neighbors, with the uh, superpowers, with with everybody. Uh, I mean, to uh, to discuss based on um, our um, uh, our uh, points, our uh, let's say uh, our glass, which is uh, half uh, full, half empty, to to uh, work uh, on those. Uh, on the, on the full part and try to uh, relate to the world and uh, make the vision better. So the whole thing, I think uh, the whole um, uh, people, uh, every people who is active inside the country uh, is hoping and trying his or her best uh, to, uh, to, let's say, um, direct the country to this direction, to go to the right direction and have uh, a normal relationship with everybody in the world and have uh, the right economic policies. Uh, thank you very much. You didn't mention anything about uh, the environment for women entrepreneurs, which I would like to hear uh, uh, about it. If okay. you have it, if you want to uh, add a few po points, yes. Uh, okay, just, just a few points is that uh, the situation uh, is uh, as difficult as we uh, talked uh, for men. So you can imagine that uh, it can uh, be much, much worse for women. Uh, although, again, uh, there are uh, uh, positives. The positive part, I can say, is the, um, the young generation, the, the very, um, let's say, educated uh, young generation, female um, generation, female, uh, let's say, uh, youth who are um, uh, driving uh, and, uh, let's say, um, changing the barriers. Everybody is trying to make the barriers um, a step further to, to have the freedom, to have the uh, equality uh, and and uh, rights, which um, which is not uh, very brilliant at the moment. Yeah, well, uh, thank you very much. I want I would like to add that uh, when you talked about the female talent in the, I mean, it's a it's a topic that is very close to my heart, as many of you know. Um, about the female talent. Uh, I would like to add that uh, around the world, everybody is talking about getting women into STEM fields. Uh, and when I looked at some of the statistics that, uh, that UNESCO provides, uh, about 60% of university students in Iran have been women for the past two decades. 
And what is interesting is about 70% of those in STEM fields have been women. So, in, uh, and I, I see that both um, Mrs. Tairani as well as Dr. Basubandi are both, uh, have both engineering degrees as their undergraduates. So there is no, no shortage of uh, women in, uh, in uh, really marketable fields and marketable professions. Uh, it's just like the environment has to, to be uh, better. We are, uh, I mean, running uh, out of uh, time very quickly. Let let me just go very quickly pa um, back to all of you, uh, you and ask you a question. Um, whenever you talk to, to Iranians, they say, oh, you know, it's about the sanctions, it's about the sanctions. Uh, but there is a lot that can be done even inside Iran. I think both uh, uh, Mrs. Tayrani as well as uh, Dr. Hamedani and uh, also uh, Dr. Bazubandi and Mr. Amiri, all of you talked about the fact that there are a lot of things that, uh, that are wrong, uh, that, are, that should be fixed. But um, why isn't it being fixed? I mean, if you are if uh, if you you are under pressure from outside, you would try to fix or to clean the house inside the country. Could you maybe give us some uh, ideas about what is impeding reforms, and certainly reforms that could make the livelihood and the economy better for all? Why isn't it being done? And uh, just to uh, add to it, uh, Professor Pesaron, who is one of the, you know, Iran's perhaps most renowned economists, uh, he wrote a paper recently saying that about only 20 percent of all of the, let's say, exchange rate fluctuations or growth uh, fluctuations uh, relate to uh, sanctions and about 80 percent of those. Uh, are due to other policy whatever, or wrong policy choices that, that are made. So let me ask you, let me get your frank and uh, frank opinion about um, can, can't we do anything even if the sanctions were to, to exist? Uh, can't, can't, we do, um, can't we improve things uh, in, in Iran uh, for the youth, for the uh, poor, for the women, for everybody else? Uh, so let me start with you. Uh, Mr. Amiri, and um, and then we go through the same cycle again, please. Um, yes, we can. Uh, it will take time, but yes, uh, it's 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 viable. Um, you know, we've got we've got nastinesses in our. Uh, you know, we've got rentier state dynamics going on. You know, the curse of oil, and this is not cultural. This is not specific to Iran. You know, you get that in Russia and Europe. You get that in Nigeria and in. In, in Africa, in, in, in Saudi Arabia, you get it in North America, and you know, in, in, in the American continent with Mexico and Venezuela. So you know, this oil wealth uh, owned by nation states pouring into an economy. In every one of these, uh, you know, you see a big presence of the government sector within the GDP of that country. And uh, you know, it is uh, you know, the, the only only Norway got it right. And you know, everybody in Iran, policymaker knows about Norway and how to keep this Dutch disease or whatever it is out of the economy. So, you know, those knowledge sets are in there within the ecosystem of uh, the, the governance of Iran today. Um, yes, we can change. It's going to take time. Uh, in my view, one of the biggest ones is subsidies, subsidies that have been existent for 40 years, uh, and they were there very initially by way of benefit, you know, um, have now become rights. Uh, so, you know, 10 cents of petrol, you know, for the leader is a right, it's not a benefit. That's how the collective views it. So how do you change that? You can't change that overnight. Uh, we've had some experience of that. You have to change it, you know, predictably with good communication to the population over a 10 year period. It won't be overnight. Again, those solutions are known. Um, they need to be addressed. Uh, the fact that they're known, in fact, one of these things that sa the sanctions has done is that, you know, we may have had a swamp full of water, you were floating in it, that water is gone, that, you know, um, the swamp, the dirt is showing, uh, laying bare for everyone to see, and that is the start where, you know, um, I cannot um, imagine, you know, uh, 20 years ago, the amount of focus on our problems that there is today. So this is a good thing. Um, and um, I think we're at the first steps of genuinely trying to, uh, to, to solve for these. And I, in my view, every part of our economy with every part of our, uh, wherever we are, we need to focus and help whoever is in governance to get these right. And you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll just end with this, you know, 
um, over centuries, decades, you know, we've got cultures that form beliefs. We've got beliefs. These form, um, 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 they, these form uh, ideologies. Ideologies form policies. Policies have outputs. They have results. Uh, those results, society will test whether you want it or not, wherever that society is. They will test that against you know the millsian you know the, the greatest happiness for uh, the best possible happiness for the greatest number of people iran is in the process of that and you know policies change policies change you know nothing happens you start nudging towards adjusting for ideologies and mindsets uh, collectively and i am starting to see that at every inch of the way and i am positive for that and very hopeful in it you know as any iranian it would be our duty to press it that way um i can go on i better no, thank you very uh, thank you very much this was very 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 uh, uh right to the point you're right you know we have to do much better in in educating our own population uh, about the choices that 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 are that have to be made uh, and of course polarization and uh, you know doesn't work it doesn't help um dr bazubandi if, uh, may, may i pass it on to you uh, uh, Thank can you. we blame sanctions or can we blame ourselves or blame somebody else? Both. <laughs> no, both, <laughs> both. All of the above. <laughs> I've been very open about my list and, you know, the list of uh, negative factors contributing to this. So you, another, John, you ask a question, can we implement change? I want to answer your question with another question. Do we want to implement change? Mm -hmm. That is the first question that we need to answer. And um, unfortunately, what I see especially uh, over the past decade or so, since the tightening of the sanctions, when since the uh, the narrative of economic resistance and the policy implications that comes out of that concept, and and I have to rest my case here. I I, I work on on you know the the, the re economic resistance and the culture of it and the policy implications of it, and there is a, a degree of certain uh, a personal obsession with that concept. But that aside, I genuinely see an impact and a shift on political ethos. Um, I read government documents, I read transcript of the uh, Supreme Leader's speeches, and what I see is a new political ethos, the second wave of the revolution, the Olguye uh, Tose'e uh, Islami, which is the, the uh, Islamic progress model. These are key documents that they are forming the direction of policy in Iran. Uh, in practice, I see some path dependency between, you know, various presidents and various administrations uh, in terms of tangible political impl um, the policy implications. But the political ethos that is driving um, is, is unfortunately not in favor of these reforms. The political ethos, ethos does not believe in what me and you believe as, as economic development, in, in what we see as you know, improving policy that, that requires improving the livelihood of the economy and the people and the competition at the global level and you know gaining regaining our, our our position at the at the regional level at the international level the political ethos rejects all of these and has its own pattern and at, as and has its own model uh, and unfortunately it's quite unrealistic you know it, it, all of these key documents want to turn Iran by 2020 uh, what 2060 to the uh, one of the top five economies in the world and you know with with growth of population and so on and so forth. So the elements that are proposing are unrealistic. And there is unfortunately a path dependency that runs through uh, policy implications. So as long as we, the answer to my question is that no, we, we do not want to change. I do believe that then rejects all of the possibilities of change. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yes, I mean, I, uh, what I from what I hear from uh, Mr. Amiri is that yes, we do have the capability to be a, a major economy, maybe not the fifth largest in in the world, but certainly, um, you know, the policies, as, as I understand from your uh, comments, is that the policies that are 
uh, being espoused uh, are perhaps taking us in the opposite direction. Uh, Ms. Dr. Hamedani, you know, I, I, in a recent piece that I wrote, I said that in 1980, Iran had 2% uh, of the world GDP at PPP, at purchasing power parity. Today, it is at 0.8% of global purchasing power parity. So we have been sinking and we've been sinking uh, steadily and steeply. Uh, do you think we can turn around this, uh, this, uh, uh, this trend and we could actually move up uh, um, without imposing internal sanctions on ourselves? Because I mean, there is perhaps little that we can do about, or we can do something about the external sanctions, but internal sanctions. Do you see any uh, resolve any management capability, any kind of, you know, uh, vision uh, about turning around that ship uh, of making Iran great again. <laughs> this is uh, for uh, for the lack of any better uh, slogan. Uh, I will pass it on to you. Uh, thank you for your very good question. Uh, the reality is that there is a very significant uh, evidence between the economic growth and the openness degree of each economy in the literature. And uh, the reality is that the Iranian economy is getting uh, isolated as time passes. This is something against the economic growth. If we want to reach to our uh, target as per the Iranian uh, you know, to Iran's vision 2026, uh, which is uh, the target is 8% economic growth. Uh, we need to open our economy. It means that we need to uh, have better relation with the global society. Uh, if the question is that, uh, uh, you know, we want to keep the condition uh, as much as it is, uh, yes, with such condition, with such relation with the world, we can, at most optimistic condition, we can, uh, you know, keep the condition with this economic growth. But if we want economic growth sustainable, uh, economic growth more than, for example, 4 percentage, like 8 percentage, we need to improve our foreign policy. We need to reconnect to the international economy. So uh, I think uh, it depends on our, uh, you know, point of view. If we want to uh, just uh, try to somehow produce, uh, make production in order to uh, procure our people's need uh, and continue the economic situation with current economic growth rate, uh, we can, you know, just uh, rely on our internal uh, potentials. But if we want to access to sustainable economic growth, like what is targeted at Iran's vision 2026, 8%, 8 per 8 for example, we need to open our economy. We need to reconnect to other economies. Uh, there are, uh, you know, spillovers that Iranian economy is Discluded from them uh, within uh, these years. Well, thank you very much. And uh, may I ask you, Mrs. Tayarani, if you could per perhaps um, give us your opinion about uh, whether the sanctions, um, I mean, be they there or not, whether there is something that can be done internally to really improve the situation both in terms of the environment for business, because that's a very important. There don't need to be so many barriers, so many you know, uh, uh, challenges, as well as uh, you know, uh, regulations, uh, international regulations and, and the like that Iran could easily adopt, even for its own internal markets. May I ask you to perhaps uh, uh, you know, give us your opinion? Thank you. You're on mute, actually. You're on. Uh, sorry, you're, you're. We can't hear you. Sorry. Yes. Uh, yes, there are uh, a lot to do, and a lot, a lot can be done. But uh, whether or not they will be done, that's another issue. But um, I, I think there are lots of reforms which are needed in in our uh, market in our economy uh, the, to uh, to go to the growth path because we are not on the growth path we are not growing 
our economy is not growing. And to grow, we need to have, uh, um, let's say, reforms uh, in uh, financial sector, in banking sector, in uh, subsidies, in uh, a lot of uh, fields, and uh, in particular, uh, in, um, let's say, business environment. The business environment is not uh, paved at all. Uh, it is, um, th th these things can be done. Uh, there are many countries uh, uh, who improved, for instance, Georgia improved, uh, let's say, 100 steps uh, only with um, monitoring and, uh, let's say, reforming and trying to uh, make the business environment better. And uh, in particular, because we have uh, such a, uh, let's say, so many um, educated people who are, uh, um, who would like to, to do business, to enter the economy. And uh, for the population, there is such a big, um, uh, let's say, gap uh, in the needs and what is uh, over there. So there are lots and lots of um, opportunities. For instance, you can see that uh, uh, in Iran, we have uh, um, imitation of many big, big uh, um, high tech companies, such as, for instance, Amazon. We have a similar one in Iran. They are supplying and, and it is uh, totally, uh, let's say, local. They can they can serve the region uh, if if uh, the connections are not are right if the uh, business environment is right and we can connect to the uh, neighboring countries and uh, be active there. But uh, let's say uh, the, the the sanctions and the banking uh, difficulties between uh, Iranian economy and all the rest of the world, and uh, in particular with the uh, neighboring countries, these are um, these uh, make uh, uh, such reforms, uh, let's say, difficult. But uh, there are lots of reforms, lots of uh, things which can be done and are recommended by many good economies that we have inside and outside the, the country. Uh, they know, um, let's say, uh, the basics and uh, they are uh, recommending it to the government. Whether or not the government would follow, that's <laughs> something else. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think that this is sort of like ties in with what uh, Dr. Bazubandi sa said about, uh, you know, the resistance or the resilience economy that they are talking about policies, but not perhaps the policies that that seem to be, uh, you know, being put forward, but in fact, you know, really deep rooted. Uh, structural reforms and uh, institutional reforms that are possible. Uh, I'm getting quite a few questions in, uh, but I wanted to first uh, ask uh, Barbara if she wants to pose her question because we had talked about her, her question before and before I move uh, to some of the questions that have come in. Uh, Barbara, would you like to ask your question? Barbara, uh, can you hear me? Well, maybe I can ask her a question. She she wanted to find out how. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yes, Barbara. Sorry. Sorry, I I was I was muted. Um, yeah, my question uh, is is, and I'll, I'll incorporate perhaps a couple of the questions that are coming in the Q and A. First, thank you, everyone. Fantastic uh, presentations. My question is really about the the Vienna talks. What uh, and this is particularly directed uh, toward our speakers in Iran. Um, or uh, who are Iranian citizens, what is the expectation in the country? Do people think that a deal is going to be reached? Uh, what would be the consequences psychologically, I guess, and as well as economically, if, if there isn't a deal? And then there, there are some questions coming in. One was, you know, uh, how quickly could Iran's economy recover? Uh, if if sanctions are are lifted, uh, you know there is a concern, obviously, that this might only be a temporary reprieve, that we might have a Republican president in the United States in 2024 that would walk out of the deal again. So I'm just curious how you all are positioning yourselves um, for these Vienna talks. Do you think there there will be a deal? Is there pressure on the government to reach a deal? And if there is one, how can you benefit even in the, the short term 
for the next couple of years from such sanctions relief. Really. Thank you. Uh, who would you I like would to just start? volunteering. Yes, oh. yes go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Cool. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I wasn't sure if we should volunteer to answer, or we should just wait for your call. Um, so, um, it, sadly enough, over the past um, couple of decades, what happened in the conversations around Iran is that the agency of people are being taken away from them. Uh, this population, this 80-something million population, is assumed from outside of Iran as a static, surrounded, completely frozen bunch of people who do not have any impact on what's happening um, inside or, or in terms of you know, impact on, on Iran's foreign policy. But I, I believe that it's exactly opposite. And I do believe that um, one of the reasons that the government decided to go back to negotiation tables and indeed the first time around for wanting to to get a deal is that the pressure is increasing the tension is is brewing inside Iran the socioeconomic dissatisfaction is completely obvious and it's naked and and it's it's very hard to ignore it so there is a pressure what is going to happen if the deal falls through uh, I really don't know that that's beyond me to answer that, but there is definitely an, a degree of expectation. Um, and, um, you know, of course, um, every Iranian citizen nowadays is, is a foreign policy analyst. People are glued to their social media. People are glued to their satellite TV channels. They follow everything religiously. They are extremely politically aware and well-educated in what's going on in the world. Um, and there is this expectation. And I do personally really hope that this, this deal goes, goes um, through because I can see that there is a direct impact on the livelihood of the people. The President Rouhani tried to position himself in his campaign, sorry, President Raisi, uh, I'm still in President Rouhani's mood, tried to position himself um, uh, in his campaign quite uh, smartly to say, I'm not going to be the one who links the future of Iranian economy and the future of the livelihood of the people with a deal. Um, but um, I do believe that the, 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 these two are, are, are quite strongly interlinked. Um, how long does it take for the Iranian economy to recover? Uh, it all depends on the policy choices. I, I'll go back to my three points. It, it all depends on the policy choices of the government. Uh, can I maybe move to uh, Dr. Hamdani and, and uh, uh, Mrs. Tairani first before coming back to uh, Mr. Amiri? Yes, please, Dr. Yes, uh, uh, thank you so to, much. Uh, Barbara's question. Yes. Yes, all right. Thank you. Very good question. Uh, in response to your question, Barbara, I should say that uh, I should ask uh, another question. Does potential nuclear deal uh, between Iran and the global powers uh, will lead to reconnection of the Iranian economy to the international economy? I don't think so. We have an experience. JCPOA was, a, was an experience. As uh, all of us witnessed, the JCPOA had some positive and constructive economic effects for the Iranian government, but not necessarily for Iranian people. Economic uh, well-being of the Iranian people didn't change so, so much, uh, particularly in uh, mid-term and long-term. Uh, so, uh, so my reply is that I don't think so, even though nuclear deal is an uh, improvement and can be a good pattern for settling out similar mutual disputes like human rights and so on, but it is never uh, sufficient anymore. There are hundreds of other sanctions like human rights sanctions that may affect the economy negatively and destruct destructively, which needs to be lifted as well. So uh, JCPOA reviving or any other nuclear deal uh, can be a positive pattern in order to settle out other uh, mutual disputes. But for uh, economics as a whole, uh, I think it's not uh, enough and sufficient anymore. Even if all the sanctions to be lifted today 
uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that the Iran, Iran's economy can reconnect to the global society. As I told you, some of the a few uh, some of the Iranian regional competitors uh, are planning in order to omit the Iran's role from the equations of trade, uh, regional and uh, you know global trade. And they are treating the Iranian civilization, not only the Iranian economy, but also the Iranian civilization in the long run. So uh, I think there should be much more negotiation and diplomacy in order to settle out other disputes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs. Tahirani, your, your views? Um, if I could, just for a second, uh, there was a specific question about this idea of Iraq somehow replacing uh, Iran uh, as a, as a, a, a transit uh, point. I, I think that's what uh, Dr. Hamadani was, was referring to. So perhaps yes. also um, Mrs. Tyrani could talk about that Thank as a concern about losing those opportunities. Um, yeah, mm, well, the, mm, the deal between Iran and the West, or in the world, <laughs> uh, is is uh, really very much uh, being looking looked forward. Everybody is looking forward to a deal so that uh, we can go back to at least minimum standards of uh, living for uh, the majority of people. That is something which is really uh, being uh, followed, and everybody uh, is uh, hoping that the deal will happen. Uh, and uh, the, the government is uh, really under pressure from the people, from the majority of people uh, to, uh, to go for a deal. Although there is um, a very powerful minority, very, very small minority, but a um, uh, very powerful minority is, uh, is still uh, against it and they would like to go a different path. But people in general, uh, wish that uh, this deal is done and uh, is uh, achieved and uh, we will go back to um, rather normal situation. And, uh, uh, but um, whether or not this will connect us to the world economy, to the global economy, to be um, a chain of the whole uh, um, chain, uh, uh, one link of the whole chain. This is something which uh, really depends on uh, uh, policy making choices. If uh, the government and if the whole uh, country uh, chooses uh, to go uh, for for linking to the global economy. If that happens, of course, uh, uh, we have uh, all those uh, opportunities and still a window of opportunity which is not closed. But uh, if that doesn't happen, uh, then uh, we will lose. We will lose the uh, the opportunity and uh, the window of opportunity. Um, Barbara referred to Iraq. It is not the only thing. Uh, we lost uh, uh, a few big uh, pipelines, pipeline projects, a gas pipeline, oil pipeline. We we lost those opportunities and. They will never repeat because they are they are built, they are uh, constructed elsewhere rather than Iran. They have passed other uh, countries. So uh, this is uh, this is something which we all struggle and hope and uh, try to uh, to put um, let's say our force be behind our uh, small power, our small force. Uh, behind those who want to make the things right or uh, to take the right uh, uh, economic policies or uh, to take the right, uh, uh, let's say, uh, general policies uh, that, uh, that uh, we believe uh, they, they are the right ones and uh, we support them. Thank you very much, and uh, this is very, uh, very sobering uh, that you know we we are losing uh, on a daily basis or on a, a, a regular basis opportunities that should be uh, Iranian uh, opportunities, and uh, Iranians should benefit from it. May I? Uh, I mean, as I turn to uh, Mr. Amiri, could I maybe add to the questions that uh, that Barbara 
ask two little questions, uh, two little uh, additional uh, uh, queries. One is that uh, what is the role of uh, what role does Dubai play uh, in in uh, in this uh, kind of bigger firmament of uh, of Iran and and uh, its external uh, let's say relations and external uh, partners? Uh, if you could kind of talk about that as well, since you are you have been investing uh, and you have been uh, 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 your operations are regional. And the second point that I wanted to you to kind of uh, maybe refer to is. Uh, Iran is asking foreign investors to come in, as well as it, Iran is asking the diaspora to come in and and uh, and invest. And you have a vantage point of being, you know, among foreign investors that probably talk about uh, about I Iran or do not talk about Iran. That is that by itself is an important, uh, uh, you know, an, an important uh, feedback. Uh, as well as among the diaspora, do you think that uh, there is any chance that? Uh, with or without the JCPOA, something uh, there will be a flow of uh, of investment. So, if you could also take those, uh, um, you know, additional questions into account when you uh, provide us with your views. Thank you very much. You are on mute, by the way. Yeah, I'm yes. mute, and I have uh, the memory of a goldfish, so you know I might prop a few things, but. Um, Okay, that was a boatload, but here, here we go. Um, listen, um, you know, Iran has two choices, either to be, you know, the tallest in the room of pygmies, um, and that is, uh, you know, uh, I won't, you know, uh, there are some folks in the policymaking community who want, you know, Pakistan and, I don't know, Bangladesh and, you know, the rest of them, you know, uh, or whatever, to be our largest trading partners. If, you know, just take our East away, uh, you know, take China away and take Russia away and take India away, we drop from $20 trillion and those $20 trillion just want our resources. They don't want our value added engineering. And, um, you know, so we want to be big trading partners with the rest of them, you know, that leaves you a 1.5 trillion addressable market. Yes, Iran can go that way over the next 20 years and it will be the largest pygmy in the group of pygmies. Um, and then, you know, you've got the West, you've got, you know, the ideological twins of, uh, you know, EU, the US, uh, throw in Japan, throw in Korea, and boom, you're up to, what, 43, uh, 45, nearly $50 trillion. And that's where that, you know, um, a few of those sectors where we do value-added um, um, uh, uh, manipulation to our uh, natural resources and, and, and shift it into that demand set within that community sloshing in that five, 50 trillion, you'll find that our upgrade is pretty fast, pretty well. And Iranians are not dumb. Uh, you know, JCPOA opens up, uh, you know, there's gonna be deals coming from the West, deals coming from the East, and the hand of Adam Smith is gonna shift it the way it will. Um, and, and, you know, despite all the political drum beats that, you know, the messagings and the Indian dances and rain dances that goes on in politics, we'll, we're all aware about the momentum pushes driving our economy. And, you know, you know, it's 10 years. I've been, you know, in and out 40 years, 30 years. You know, we've got four years of sanctions, a terrible Trumpian uh, attitude, and suddenly, you know, our collective memory here is one, you know, um, one, you know, I should be speaking, but it's only five years we've been like this. All the rest of it, we were integrated and integrating more and more and more and more. So, you know, this could well be a small divergence we've had in a, in a, in a better path, going again back to that culture, policy, ideology shift, biggest number. You know, that core is beating in the community of Iran, and it will continue to be and self-correct to its right path. Um, with regards to Dubai, um, at beef, you know, the peak of Dubai trade with Iran was before the first sanctions fell down. And it was interesting where everywhere else bumped up uh, in the period of between 2015 to uh, 2018, Dubai remained flat. What had happened 
Iranian banks, financial institutions, transshipments, some port facilities, Iranian vessels, um, they quit going through to Dubai. They didn't need that buffer anymore. There were direct LCs from the East, there were direct LCs from the West, uh, much cheaper. So that entrepreneurial economy that Dubai used to play, you know, uh, being Iran's Hong Kong or whatever, you know, Singapore, blah, all good, but the volume went down and I would expect that, uh, you know, financial institutions, despite what people think, are pretty FATF ready in Iran right now. Um, I see it from the inside. And, you know, those direct switches will probably occur and Iranians won't bear uh, or need to bear a transshipment um, state from the UAE. So UAE will have a role, but it will be for theirs to play and, um, you know, they are all, uh, like many in a saturated world, very much looking forward to the opportunities that Iran brings. So let's say the, the Emiratis are going to be flocking into Iran. It won't be Iranians flocking into the Emirates. Uh, in terms of FDI, uh, there is a major upbeat that I feel uh, that comes to my uh, attention. Um, uh, its frequency is... Um, is 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 high has become higher, and um, in a lot of instances where we've been waiting for our partners, with our partners, we're actually um, in the process of um, taking the projects out off the shelves, uh, clearing the dust, and 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 having those second looks. It's happening already. So that dovetails into Barbara's answer to Barbara's question. Yes. There is an expectation that the deal will be done. Uh, the, of obviously, the biggest worry everyone has is the sustainability or the guarantees. So we don't want those folks to come in and, you know, um, you know, cowboys with Hermes ties come in and then suddenly go. Uh, we want them to stay. Uh, and if we are going to have to want them to stay, let's not beat around the bush. Iran needs to settle its differences with its neighbors. It needs to settle some differences with its ballistics. It needs to settle some differences uh, with Israel and the Palestinian issue. And, uh, you know, that, uh, you know, uh, maybe the main reason that, um, you know, Trump tore up things like that, it were these things happening in the region. So I think there's a good understanding of this. Everybody wants peace. It is. Uh, it does create opportunity sets for dialogues. I'm not surprised uh, why the person who is the foreign minister is that person, and he is focusing. It almost is. You know, the bridges need to be built regionally, and that is being built. In fact, uh, the JCPOA is indeed quite um, formulaic, to say the least. So I hope that gave a big. Uh, sort of biggest picture and if I missed anything or talk too much. No, thank um, you. That was uh, that was very comprehensive. Uh, we have we are we have uh, exactly uh, another five minutes uh, according to my time. Uh, if I could ask uh, just very very briefly, if you have any topic uh, or any points that you wanted to make and uh, didn't have a chance to make them, I mean, be it within the questions or outside the questions that we ask, please uh, could I have? We, we can do one very quick round before the uh, wrap ups. So please, uh, um, Dr. Bazubandia, I start with you and then, you know, ladies first, and then maybe we can come to the gentlemen. Uh, and then I close uh, with my final remarks. Uh, yes, thank you please. very much. Um, I don't have anything else to add. I just wanted to thank you. I leave the time for the rest of the panel. Thank you. It was a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Um, Mrs. Tayarani, if, uh, you, you, would you like to add any points uh, to what was said? Both uh, yourself as well as what uh, what uh, the other panelists, uh, uh, you know, shared with us. You are on mute. Uh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, nothing in particular. I, I I just want to say that uh, um, uh, I, I just wanted to confirm what. 
Mr. Emery said about uh, uh, the banks uh, being uh, very much ready for FATF. Uh, there are um, lots of things done in Iran, but uh, the general policies uh, are, are to be made. Still a lot to, to do because the general policies toward mar market economy has to be done. Today, we have 80%, uh, 70% uh, uh, state-owned uh, state uh, or uh, semi-state-owned uh, economy. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Amidani, um, I, can, I come to you. Thank you so much. Uh, as my final point, let me again emphasize on the openness of the economy. Uh, it is so. It is very important for the economic growth. It is something uh, I think which is somehow ne neglected these days within the doctrine of the uh, particularly policy, the foreign policy uh, makers. Some people think that the economic growth, sustainable economic growth, can be obtained. Uh, without constructive foreign relations with other nations. Uh, I think uh, we need to uh, discuss, negotiate with other nations in order to settle out our uh, differences. Differences in point of views uh, and uh, is totally uh, usual. We need to negotiate. We, we need to uh, bring our problems on the negotiation table. This is something which needs to be taken into account. Uh, so uh, when we uh, settle out our disputes with other nations, we will uh, able to use from an open um, free trade with other nations and uh, by this attitude maximize the welfare and well-being uh, of uh, the uh, nations of the region. Thank you so much for the opportunity again. Thank you very much. And Mr. Amiri, you have the last word. Um, well, you know, uh, just, you know, I think until now, um, you know, the two uh, twins of politics and economics in Iran, uh, politics is, as um, the sphere of politics has taken uh, a lead on, and, you know, you can have our economics having been sacrificed for it. I think um, there is a collective feeling in Iran right now that you know it needs to be now economic consolidation for whatever political uh, gains uh, you know uh, we've had over or not or we believe we've had culturally within the region. Um, and the next best foot is to consolidate that economically. Um, that is a um, you know from wherever. Um, uh, range uh, or you look at it you know there's a feeling that economy needs to come first and you know as as uh, that makes that makes me happy um and i you know look forward in the day that um you know we're sitting at the political table of uh, the p5 plus one and that's a pretty heavy that's a pretty heavy table in terms of you know league uh, but, you know, GDP per capita, we're sitting at the table of what? Bhutan. Somebody tell me where Bhutan is. We're sitting at the, you know, uh, South Africa, $11,000 per head uh, per capita, you know, and we really need to transit to where we belong. Um, and I said that uh, earlier, that would be something close to the ranges of anywhere between, um, you know, somewhere within the range of Spain. Um, and I look forward to that. I, I, I really do. It's time has come. Everybody's, um, I feel, uh, sees the positive, inevitable uh, within the core of the community. Um, and on that hopeful end, um, I thank you very much for uh, having given us this uh, opportunity. And uh, I look forward to many more on the topic of Iran. Thank, Thank you, you very much for your participation. Thank you. Well, uh, my very, very big, uh, you know, uh, uh, helicopter takeaway from from this meeting is that uh, on this 40th 
third anniversary of the revolution, um, uh, when you know, the, revolu uh, the revolutionaries made many, many promises to, Iranian, uh, to the Iranian people about much better life, much more, you know, um, uh, better living standards and uh, a lot of free, free goods and everything. None of these uh, promises have come true, um, but, uh, in a, uh, but instead, uh, lives have become much more difficult. The life of Iranians has become much more difficult. So what my takeaway is from the discussions that I've had uh, with uh, you, uh, with your excellent experiences, is that uh, the ball is in Iran's court. Iran can change many things around, and the, the time has come for Iran to take a very serious look and to take the uh, and the Iranian people, the majority of Iranian people, according to what I understand from Mrs. Tayrani, are for big changes, are ready for big changes, and that uh, and uh, they their voices are being uh, sidelined, being pushed away by a small minority that is much more hardline and much more, um, how should I say, um, you know, is not is is it doesn't doesn't get the message. So maybe in the next. Um, year or in the in the in the future we will have a more rational uh, uh, approach to this uh, to to iran's opportunities and uh, with the immense uh, with the immense resources that iran has from you know geographical standpoint as well as uh, its uh, human and natural resources hopefully we will be able to turn this corner and be able to look forward to a much better um, you know much better future uh, thank you very much. I thank you very much. And I want very much to thank the Atlantic Council to, uh, for giving us this opportunity to highlight or to discuss some of the um, you know, circumstances in Iran. And I want to very much thank the panelists, the excellent, uh, your excellent uh, balanced views of, uh, of, of, this, uh, of Iran's uh, circumstances. Uh, and with that, I wish you all um, a very enjoyable uh, rest of the day, wherever you are. And uh, thank you very much, Barbara, for, for uh, hosting this for us. Thank you so much.